If you like what you're hearing on the phillytech.org netcast network, please consider supporting the network with a small monthly donation via patreon.com slash phillytechorg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash p-h-i-l-l-y-t-e-c-h-o-r-g. And thank you in advance. You're listening to The Interview Show with Seth Goldstein on the phillytech.org netcast network. Thank you to our sponsors, wistia.com, Zoho Mail, and getflywheel.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the interview show. This is episode 41. I'm here with Zachary Smith, Zach Smith of Packet Host, and, and a plethora of other <laughs> I've, I've, known, I've known Zach and his twin brother, Jacob, for years, and then Jacob a little bit longer, but the, 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 the Smith brothers, you know, they're always up to something, you know? Yeah, well, he's the evil twin, so don't let him tell no, you. he either. definitely is the evil twin. He definitely is. <laughs> yeah. So, Zach, how have you been? What have you been up to lately? What, what is Packet? What is Packet? Well, we um, – so this is what I've been building for about a year, uh, a little over that. Uh, we started the company last June, um, and our goal is to build a single-tenant, uh, non-virtualization-based platform as an alternative to the large public clouds like AWS or Google Compute or Azure. So, so, so bare metal, like, you know, an yeah. actual kind of, I learned that word from you guys, but, you know, an actual, like, you have, your, server. you have your server, that's you. Exactly. You know, there's a nice little phrase I like to use, which is the cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. Right. Yeah. And so what we're doing is we're renting people in the same kind of mainly developers yeah. um, in a very consistent, very programmable, very elastic manner. But instead of introducing multi tenancy where many people are sharing the same server. Right. And putting on that virtualization layer, we give people entire server instances. So our target customers are generally larger. They're SaaS platforms or people who are running their own private clouds and they don't want to go into racking and stacking their own servers in a data center. So they want the on demand capabilities of a public cloud, but they don't have any need or use for virtualization or maybe sharing those server instances. with. Or they don't want to. Yeah, they don't want to. Most so we of them, all know what virtualization you know, does. I mean, virtualization is better than the shared shared cloud, you right? Know, <laughs> a shared hosting, but you know, yeah. still, I mean, it's you have a apartment versus now you have a building. Exactly. Yeah. So it depends. You know, if you want to be a landlord, you want to buy the building, right? And so the, yeah. most of our customers want to be the landlord. They are offering a SaaS or a hosted service, um, or it's very important to their business. They're a factory of some sort making widgets, right? Um, and so they want the whole thing, um, and they want them with the same kind of speed and agility that they get out of a public cloud. They just want bare metal. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. So those who don't know Zach's background. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, where you came from. I, I know you went to Juilliard. So you're, yeah. a, you're a music guy, just like your brother. I think Jacob plays the bassoon, you play the bass. Exactly. Well, you know, they had a, a lot of how to start your own tech company classes at Juilliard back in exactly. 2000. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, you're right. I went to Juilliard. I was a classical musician. And um, like most good classical musicians, as soon as I got out of school, I threw up my hands and said, how am I going to find a job? Right. Mm -hmm. And I Even ended in up New York. in New York. Even in New York. Even in New York. But, you know, somebody, you got to pay rent. You got to do all that stuff. Right. And I was always into computers. And this was back in um, late 2000, early 2001. And the internet.com boom was kind of on its last legs then. Um, great time and to come out. Great time to come into it, right? Um, yeah. But what I saw is, you know, a pretty big macro trend uh, um, that the internet was here to stay and was growing. That didn't take a rocket scientist to figure no. that out. Yeah. And um, a buddy of mine um, had a relative back in California who had started a competitive. Which is where you guys are from. Yep, from California. And uh, he had started a phone company after the 1996 deregulation, right? So he had started a CLEC. And he had convinced me, basically said, Zach, if you ever go into business, um, make sure you do something that has recurring revenue. 
sell mm. the customer once and be able to provide them service again and again and again, right? And so I thought about that as it turns to the internet and um, basically came up with the idea to start reselling hosting services. Ah, so, hosting it started, so it started young. Yep. So really just, you know, nobody had websites. Everybody had to have a website. All my friends at Juilliard needed to have a website, right? Ah, you know, everybody needed a website. Go. So we just started. I, I you know, I, um, I bought some big servers and, you know, like we were just talking about, you know, uh, divvied them up um, using some software and uh, started selling virtual hosting. And frankly, you know, I, back then. Yeah, back in 2001, right? And um, I became very involved with the people who I had originally bought the servers from or rented them from and ended up buying half of the business, right? Um, it, how old were you then? Uh, well, I guess, yeah, it was just after school. So it was about 20, 21. Yeah. Wow. And uh, it was great. It was like the early, like Wild West days of the internet, right? Um, mm -hmm. We didn't know a lot, but nobody knew a lot. So it didn't it was, matter. It was a great time to get in. You know, it was yeah. Like, Everyone's just kind of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. So, you know, you were able to go out there and reinvent yourself and try things out. And um, the thing that we didn't have was that we didn't have any capital. Ooh. Right. So and, you know, in the hosting business, um, the general rule of thumb is for every dollar of recurring revenue you get, you need to spend about ten dollars up front, mm -hmm. you know servers cost money, racks or data center space or whatnot. And so, you know, we had to grow very slowly because we didn't have any capital. Um, so you would kind of grow a little bit and then you would coop, recoup the investment and then you grow a little bit more, right? And um, so we grew that business along the way. We were very software driven, always trying to create our own software platforms to run and manage the business. That's actually, I think, what cre created the value long term. Um, it gave us a lot of flexibility in choosing where we would do and how we would do it as the industry changed from being, hey, back in 2000, if you were a startup, you raised a few million dollars so you could buy sun gear, right? Yeah. And put it in a data center. And by 2007, you were buying AWS instances by the hour. So things yeah, changed yeah. dramatically. Keep on, keep, on, keep, on, keep on bringing stuff in, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it was And really, AWS really awesome. crashes and then the, half the internet dies. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to uh, we had to react to all that and change. And luckily, we owned our own software stack. So we were able to move. Um, yeah. The business grew and we kept at it. In 2009, we raised some private equity um, capital. Kind of Voxel, right? Yeah. So it was a company called Voxel. Um, we uh, we raised some private equity, um, about five and a half million dollars. Um, and it didn't stay very long because we got bought in 2011. So we sold to a publicly traded firm out of Atlanta um, called Internap. And um, our platform became the basis for their entire public cloud. And so right, it was, that's, a nice little, that's a nice little hat tip to you. Saying, hey, yeah. You guys, yeah. And hey, full disclosure, I did some work with Voxel, so full disclosure. <laughs> yes, absolutely, all good. It had to help. It had to help us get known. We were we were trying absolutely everything. You know, one thing that that I learned from the experience, though, is mm -hmm. you know we were not. And, and Seth related back to you, like it was totally cult marketing, right? We had zero marketing budget versus say the big guys, right? So all we had to do, all we could do is find our little audiences and then treat them really well and create ways where they could virally tell their friends, right? So viral. yeah, that's the way that we could build it, you know, and you know, it worked really well and it taught us to focus on our customer. Um, a lot of good lessons from that. Exactly. So then, so Voxel was sold, you were an internet for, I think nine months. Yep. Uh, yeah. I think that is for part of the stipulations. They usually say, guys, don't disappear on us right away. Yeah, they don't usually like that after they give you a big check. <laughs> they hang out for a little bit, help us get things situated, and then, you know, go play. Pretty much, yeah. So I saw through, um, you know, as part of a deal like that, there's a bunch of transitionary things that you need to do, not only from like a corporate governance standpoint, you know, think about things like make sure that your bank accounts move over or your, you know, employees have proper, you know, controls or whatnot. But also we had to transfer a lot of technology to them. Um, mm -hmm. So there was, you know, kind of some stipulations around how that would happen. We finished that up. You know, the business grew really well that first year that we were there. So I think everybody Everybody felt it was one of the more positive acquisitions, um, you know. But honestly, I'm an entrepreneur, so uh, you saw the bug. Yeah, yeah, I got the bug. So you know, I left the business. I waited out some non-competes, did some what I would say uh, consulting, world traveling, etc., to find yeah. out where I thought the market was going, and um, got back in um, in uh, early late 2000 or early or mid 2014, right? So yeah, since yeah, Jacob told me about, it. yeah, and, yes. and you did cloud RFP for a little while there too. 
Yeah, that was really part of my market research, right? So what we did yeah, is that we, was neat. I helped you out with that. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So what we did is, well, you know, I, I took an analytical approach, right? I had time on my hands. So I said, <laughs> instead of just, you know, going like this and saying, what do I think is where the market is going, right? We went out and we surveyed the entire cloud landscape. We gathered data on about 250 global cloud companies, found yeah. out where they were, what products they sold, what type of customers they had. Uh, it was a super interesting experience. And I think it was because, you know, I was an operator um, when, when we ran Voxel, but after I sold the business, I could go back to all my competitors and talk to them very freely, right? So they all knew you. Yeah, it was, it was, they knew me, but I wasn't competing with them. It was great for both sides. I got to give them all kinds of touch points around the industry, and I got to mm -hmm. ask them about how things were going for them. You and scratch their back, they scratch your back, and everything's, you know. Done. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, so we, you know, we, it was learning experience for everybody. Um, so I think the Cloud RFP, um, you know, kind of project was, was, was very informative for me. And what it told me in the end was that nobody was really putting – you know, solid resources in terms of creating new product in the bare metal space. Mm -hmm. Everybody was focused on virtual public cloud, how to compete with Amazon. And I said, you know, there's, there, there's different ways people want to buy their infrastructure and Amazon is going to own Amazon's business, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. the better way is why don't we focus on this little part of the market over here, which is not actually very little, um, but it's not really getting a lot of attention. It wasn't very yeah. sexy. People weren't paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. So I said, what if we could go in, build some great software, um, and really solve some of those hard problems around physical server automation? Absolutely. So we raised, uh, we raised a few million bucks, brought in about um, you know, 15, 20 people that we had known from our you know, previous experiences in the industry, and got to work. And we spent about a year um, hunkered down, uh, really writing our the, our the platform of our dreams, and uh, we launched it back in June. And we have today, uh, yeah, five hundred customers, and you know we're starting to book revenue. So you know it's, it's that that seedy, very tough part of a, a business where you're turning from a, a science project into a, a mm. real functioning organization. So it's fun. Absolutely. So. Yeah. When you're not working on packet, what else do you do? I know you have a lot. I mean, I looked at your LinkedIn before the show, as I said. Yeah. And you have your hands in a bunch of different things. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things I, I'm super passionate about is helping other entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I've invested in a bunch of small businesses, usually in seed rounds. That's where I like to help out when people are just at the cusp of an idea and they need their first, you know, hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars to really prove it out um i love that area it's where i think i can help people the most so i've been fortunate enough to be in an industry where there's a lot of new companies um and so i've invested in a bunch of uh smaller businesses infrastructure wise some of them have gone on like a company called kentic out in uh, california has gone on to raise a significant series a and b or not b but series a other companies here in new york and what i find is most interesting I, yeah, you know, there's money, right? You can raise money from people, right? Yeah. But I think the real, the value that, that I've been able to impart to at least some of these businesses is, you know, my kind of day-to-day -day operational experience of how to build an early stage company. Mm -hmm. So what I focus on is um, uh, a metrics and reporting suite that I make all kind of investors uh, or investments that I put money into do, um, which just you know gets your your process in place for your financials, for tracking your key metrics, for mm. communicating to your investors and your board and your constituents on a regular you know cadence, um, and also to give yourself like context when you're small. Oh, absolutely, if you don't know where you're going, it's kind of like where are we going and like. And there's no context yeah people forget how hard it is to remember what you did three months ago right it wasn't possible if you and it down. when you're when you're doing so much it's really hard to remember well what what really happened in august why did we make that decision last year mm -hmm. and and more importantly when you go look for help let's say you have a great board member who wants to help you out or an investor and you've spent you know 18 hours a day for six months you know with all this kind of contextual information about your business why you made these decisions and you go and ask that board member for help if he doesn't have like the reader's digest version of how you got here it's almost impossible for him to help you right mm -hmm. you need to spend hours and hours and hours telling somebody who probably doesn't have a lot of time right mm -hmm. you know 
well, how did I get here? And why did we make this decision? And what is our competition like? And so I find that that communication process on a regular cadence is one of the most valuable things a small company can do. It's also the thing that people put off and don't do because frankly, mm -hmm. it doesn't add quote unquote a lot of value to building your product, right? You know, it it take time value. out of your day, yeah. right? You know, take, I think generally it takes a good founder, you know, at six hours to put together a good management package. And I suggest doing it every month, but within the first five, six days of the month closing, Wow. you know, and that's a lot of time for an entrepreneur, but it pays back huge dividends, um, at least from my experience. So that's one yeah. of the things I really enjoy. Good experience. Yeah. Helping. Well, I think it helps. So it's, it's just a tool, but, um, you know, I've, I help, uh, work on that. And then, you know, what else do I do? I, I got two young kids. So I got a three year old, a six year old. Oh, they're so cute. Well, one, one, one's a model. Right. <laughs> he manages to uh, to get pictures taken every once in a while. So he's an maybe, entrepreneur himself, you know. He's well, a, that's my retirement plan, you know, right? Yeah, he is an entrepreneur. I mean, they're <laughs> very cute kids. You know, they're very cute kids, you know. And then put them together with Jacob's kids, and oh my god, it, we're gonna have a basketball team soon. Five kids, five boys. That's what we need, right? Exactly. Well, you, you have a little girl too. Who's absolutely gorgeous. So. Yeah. So it's good times, but it's a great time to be in New York. Um, the startup scene here is fantastic. Oh, it's blowing um, up. Super busy, much different than it was in 2005 where, you know, there were no meetups and finding a VC in New York was, you know, I don't know, like finding a free apartment, right? It didn't exist. Um, but now there's a, a vibrant community, lots of great people, good mm -hmm. access to capital. And more importantly, and I think for Philadelphia too, because if we need a VC, we can just go an hour north instead of going across the country. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we have a really good ecosystem. So I encourage anybody who's down in Philly to come just look at the meetup schedules and whether it's the, you yeah, know, you're two hours away by train. Well, yeah. it's not two hours, but car and train, but you're about an hour, you know, to take, take, take the bus. Yeah. It's a, it's a really good experience and there's so much going on that literally you just pick a day and come up and you will absolutely be able to go to uh, a relevant meetup where you can meet, you know, both other entrepreneurs as well as, you know, financing partners or, or venture capital. Absolutely. Yeah. Be careful with that, but you know, it's worth the experience. It's time, you know, but no, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Zach, thanks for being on the show. I know you're a very busy guy. You have to get back to building servers. Yeah, people got to make servers. The internet's got to run, you know? Absolutely. So thanks for being on there. So where can they find you online? Where's the best place to find you? Just go to packet.net. That's P-A-C-K-E-T dot net. It's a great domain. All right, Seth. You be well. See you later. Be well. See you. Bye.